And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Liliana Lubacic, whose near-death experience helped her evolve her consciousness, which today we're going to learn about and more. Liliana, thank you for joining me and welcome. Jeff, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. So, thank you. Liliana, let's start on the day that your NDE happened and go from there. Okay. I, my first NDE happened. I was about 15 years old and I came back from high school, lay down on the sofa, and suddenly I just felt that my body was so, so weak, lo- losing its energies, and perceived something like a thread, like a at that time, I, I could only explain to my parents, it was like a chewing gum that was stretching from solar plexus right up to the universe. And uh, I had a knowing in that particular moment that uh, if that snaps out, I'll die. That was the first near-death experience. So then I perceive, I could see my late grandmother, um, uh, you know, slapping my face and calling me and calling mom and dad to help out. And then dad came and I've seen it all from above, from the above of where I was. And I uh, started slapping my face and pouring water over my face. And I got back. And that experience was quite petrifying because I wasn't, uh, that was the first time ever, that kind of experience. And I was scared. I was scared. I know that grandma said to my parents, hurry up, Liliana's eyes rolled up. So uh, they were scared as well, but it was left like that. So uh, after that, that was the first time. The second experience, near that experience was during the labor when I was giving birth to my daughter. I was given an epidural in the morning and um, Maybe nobody knew at that time that I was diabetic, or maybe I don't know even to that to this day what happened and how that was not uh, confirmed by doctors. But I suddenly, uh, after having epidural, uh, I suddenly started feeling a bit weak. And uh, I remember one thing: I desperately needed sugar, so I must have been going into a diabetic coma. And uh, I call out to nurse my bed, like we were in pre-delivery room, I think six beds next to each other. And my bed was the closest one to the nurse's station. There was a nurse uh, and I cried out and I said, please help me, I think I'm dying. She didn't turn her head and she basically said, oh, you're not the first, not the last, you know, to, to give a bird. So I, got it the more you know whatever energy i could have at that moment and i said please help i am dying the girl or lady next bed to mine told her husband who was with her honey go and check on that uh, uh lady i feel she's not well and he told her you know in swearing words uh, don't let bloody bitch you know scare you you know and my last thought physical in these three arms was, uh, please, dear God, don't let me die here amongst these evil people. And don't let my parents, my husband and his parents, you know, uh, be saddened by my and my baby's death. Because my baby calmed down. She stopped moving when I started experiencing that. And I knew that she perceived that as well. well. And then I just uh, put a prayer from my heart to the universe to God, saying, please, God, help me out. Don't let me die amongst these evil people. And suddenly, as the nurse station was on my, to my right, there was a corridor in a hospital, and um, another nurse walked in, and she wore absolutely different uniform. It was like a World War One uniform, uh, you know, with those caps and a blue and white uh, cardigan. And she walks right to my bed while she was bypassing the nurse. She was saying, that lass doesn't look well. She is all pale. I hope you're going to save her. 
that day I learned two new English words, and that is less and pale. So uh, that nurse, I, I seen everything from the top of the ceiling, and that nurse, you know, almost broke all her instruments, run, and they tried to pull me up to sit up, calling my name. Uh, and I don't remember anything until uh, doctors came in. There were six of them with two doctors. And um, they rushed me into the delivery room. It was very, very painful and hard delivery. However, that nurse that walked in was standing on my right hand side and she was communing with me and I was communicating with her. And I asked her, you know, I, I said, because I, I am Slav, Serbian, and we always would like to reward someone who helps us. So I said um, to her, I would like to uh, give you a box of chocolates or something, where can I find you? And she said, uh, you don't have to look for me. I've been sent out today here to help you. Uh, I don't have a permanent place of employment. I just go when I am called out and sent out for help. And she said, I will stay with you until 10 past three when your baby girl will be when your baby girl will be born. She told me I will have a baby girl before Christina was born. So she stayed with us, with me, when baby was born. And that was the only thing that I could know at that time about her. I discussed with my husband, and he says, Oh, Lily, there were so many nurses and doctors around you. And you were probably delirious. I know that you were talking to someone, on, you know, to, to your right hand. And um, I said, but there was a nurse in a different uniform. And he said, well, I don't remember, you know, I don't know, but they were all nurses. Um, that prompted me to search for that particular miracle that happened to me and my daughter. <clears throat> and one of the Catholic nurses, uh, Catholic nuns, uh, whose sister used to work with me, uh, told me when I described how this lady looked like, she said, Liliana, it could be probably Sister Francis. I didn't know who Sister Francis was at that time. So I started uh, researching, going to libraries, going to Sydney City Library and found uh, there was an organization in Sydney. Uh, um, it was near that experience, this organization. It was registered in Mulara at, and it only had a PO box and phone number. And I remember calling them and you know, spoke to somebody and they took my address. They said, they will send me the picture and certain articles from newspapers about miracles of Sister Francis and people who experienced near death experiences. So apparently Sister Francis helps people who are uh, uh, going to uh, near that experiences. That was quite frightening. And that uh, experience left an imprint on my daughters and my soul and memory. Um, although Christina, you know, she couldn't remember, but she's a being of very high consciousness, uh, a being of light. When I got pregnant, when she, I knew I was pregnant, I would be pregnant. Uh, I remember clearly it was 3.20 a.m. in the morning and uh, I perceived an orb. At that time, I didn't know what, you know, the meaning of orb, word orb, but there was a golden orb traveling from through the window right up into my belly. And I knew that I conceived. So these are experiences uh, that I had. Uh, there were some other near-death experiences. I did not know perhaps that I, uh, even as a young child, had a severe sleep apnea. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but before we go there, let me ask you a couple questions. I need to clear something up. Were you outside of your body when this happened? I was outside of my body. Okay. It's fascinating for me because I've had another guest, maybe two, see this nurse that looked like she was dressed in the 1940s or 50s before. But you're the first person who said that it was St. Francis. Do you feel pretty positive that that's who that was? Absolutely. 
because uh, after that, I've seen, uh, you know, I research. At that time, we didn't have computers. But as I said, the first article I received from was from that uh, PO box in Mulara, you know, of that organization that uh, uh, was kind of a membership of people who had uh, near that experiences. And I don't know what happened with that organization later on, but I am pretty sure that I have uh, uh, had articles, article newspaper clips uh, sent out to me, and uh, it, I'm pretty sure it is her. Is it common for her to appear to people as a nurse? Yes, and only as a nurse. What I what I know, what I am aware of. Did you have any other conversation with Saint Francis? No, the only conversation ever took that day, it was Friday, 3rd of December, 1983 at Sydney St. George the Fourth, St. George V Hospital. Um, only then, no more, no more apparition or she visiting us. Have you read up on the history of St. Francis? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about her? I can say only what I recall from readings and uh, it is that uh, I think she was in World War One nurse. Um, she helped in, uh, injured soldiers and wounded soldiers, and uh, because of her great merits and love to help people, uh, she was consecrated as a saint. Uh, and uh, after she passed away, after she was consecrated, or even before she was consecrated, I would say. Uh, uh, she was pronounced uh, as um, as a saint due to her miracle post mortem work. Were you a religious person before this experience? No. Did it change you in any way as far as religion goes? It did. I was born in former Yugoslavia, where you know it was still communism, hard hardline communist uh, system. Uh, we were not allowed to worship or celebrate uh, Serbian Orthodox uh, Saint Day days or Orthodox Easter, Orthodox Christmas, or any of those days. We have our own uh, home family patron, Saint Nicholas. We were not uh, able to do any of that. However, our maternal grandmother managed to have me baptized and my younger sister, 10 years younger, um, at home secretly when dad was not at home. Uh, that was arranged privately and secretly. And that's how many people in my generation were baptized. So the only uh, connection to God and to religion came through my grandmother, who fa father's mother, who actually used to tell us that God is our father. And she would have to explain to me, you know, what she meant by that, his father of all human beings and everything living on in the world. But um, beyond that, no Bible in the house, no visitations to churches, nothing like that. Sister Francis has changed. That, that experience with Sister Francis' miraculous help uh, has changed me. And I turned to Bible, turned to... Um, uh, 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 Catholic and Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox uh, churches, uh, and then it later on evolved to different uh, faiths and different religions. Uh, in my heart, I am Orthodox. I love Jesus, but in my heart, this is what it is now, specifically because of the experience I had in 2006 in Belgrade when um, I was uh, in Belgrade on a business and slept at my cousin's place in village where I was born. And just overnight, uh, suddenly that hum humongous, uh, uh, this, this is unmeasurable power, feeling, emotion, waves of love in my heart woke me up. <clears throat> it was pitch dark. Uh, I was sleeping on a sofa. I sat down and perceive the light coming from the light from the left hand side of the room and thought, oh, my cousin left the light, a uh, uh, night light for me if I need to go to bathroom. But it was, it, the light was calling me. So I turned my head and there she was, 
mother. I just perceive her as my mother. And uh, the reason why I left um, uh, the, the curtains here was um, I tried to portray her, to make a portrait of that apparition. Uh, she didn't speak any word to me. She was just uh, in Oriole, golden Oriole, and her hands stretched out, and she emanated love, just a love, pure, pure love. And that love is bigger than, as big as universe, I would say, you know, that I held my hand here. So from that moment on, my mystical journeys began, and uh, stronger faith and stronger belief in Mother Mary and Jesus. Have you heard of Medjugorje? I think that's close by in Croatia, where a lot of people see Mother Mary. Yes, I have heard. I, I read it. I was still a young journalist uh, or editor at that time of ethnic newspaper in Sydney uh, when operations happened in Medjugorje. I think it was 1986, I would say. I was just wondering if you had ever been there and had an experience with Mother Mary. No, not there. No, they are. It's uh, apparently I read many books, and uh, there is no history uh, of recorded uh, apparition of Mother Mary in Serbia. But there was a discussion in letters between a Serbian Orthodox monk and a Catholic uh, monk from Saint Francis, I think it's called, branch of Fran Franciscans, Francis Franciscans. And uh, somebody dug out uh, that conversation um, with written conversation uh, saying that uh, Serbian Orthodox said, uh, no, they don't have anything recorded, but there is a story that Mother Mary appeared once in a small village in Serbia. So this would ha happen to me. It happened only to me, but it did happen in Serbia. Um, just like Mother Mary appeared in Medjugorje in Croatia. So I am just thinking that Mother Mary appears there where she has a message to pass on, uh, no matter where the people are, no matter whether it is a Catholic or Orthodox, uh, because we have we are same, same for of us. So my as I said to me, there was no other message except love. Love in the heart. And that love is something that has been taken over my life since 2006, although there were confusions and uh, possibilities, you know, I tried to understand what was ha what happened, but felt insecure to speak to Serbian Orthodox priests. So I did speak to a uh, Egyptian Coptic priest in Sydney, and ask him if he would know what happened. And he says, Mother Mary always appears to help others when someone's life is in danger. So, you know, she didn't say a word to me. There was nothing except that beautiful, beautiful young virgin uh, with a beautiful smile, with uh, eyes, Blue, blue, purple eyes, big like this, you know, and uh, entire universe in her eyes. And her nose, it was, uh, is uh, almost, um, I would say, alien. Mm, wow. How was she dressed? Oh, that's why I prepared this. Uh, I wanted to show, as I said, I tried to port make a portrait, but it's far from it. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. That's very nice. She wore a white cloak, a white cloak, and she appeared, you know, half upper part of her body. Uh, here on this painting, I couldn't, because I'm not a painter, but I could not uh, find a way how to paint her arms outstretched to me. She was in this golden, Orangey golden, soft golden, soft orangey golden light all the time. And she was just glowing, you know, she was emanating light and love. And uh, her skin is absolutely just like a sea pearl, beautiful white skin. 
um, smile and her eyes. I mean, I think if nothing else, at least I managed to catch that expression in her eyes, which is deepness of knowledge, wisdom, love, and universe. Now, you said that her nose was alien or alien-like. Do you, do you feel that she is not from Earth? Sorry? Do you feel that she's possibly not from Earth? Absolutely not from Earth. Absolutely not. She is from different realm. And um, uh, in another experience that I had, uh, uh, you know, um, World as, as we perceive it doesn't exist in reality. What exists is a parallel world. Mm. Just a parallel world, you know, and they are parallel like that. Although it looks like we are in a big circle, big or big dark orb with all these beautiful skies, but it is just a parallel world. And uh I had a past life regressions and uh, came to conclude out came to conclusion out after that that um, everything is here, like the energies, human humanoid energies, uh, everything is here, uh, and we are all connected with it. Uh, however, past lives are not really past lives; they exist. They're still existing in the parallel worlds. So anything bad that I would do or good that I would do now in this lifetime uh, absolutely uh, reflects on the parallel life. Are you saying that all lives are happening at the same time? Yes. But in parallel timelines? Parallel time, parallel time lives, yes. That is my experience and my belief, and I have no fear of transition uh, or death, because it will happen when it happened, but when it's supposed to happen. So, yes, I just put um, Mother Mary on the side. I prepared this just for you to see, to show you. Thank you. Let me ask you this. So, if all of our lives are happening at the same time, then there really isn't reincarnation back to another life, right? Uh, it is up to us because the decision on whether we will reincarnate into the other life uh, are made in that pure, in the space which I call, because I experience it, a bold. A what? Just a bold. A-B-O-D-E. Oh, a bold. Okay. Yes. So... Uh, after each death, we are in a boat, mm -hmm. okay? And that is a consciousness. It's boundless, a boat. That's how I perceive it. Uh, and all decisions, or what we call, I, I, I couldn't call it contracts because it was decisions about the lifetimes and events are made in that space of a boat. Which do you think affected you more? Your near-death experience in the hospital or encountering Mother Mary? Both, but encountering Mother Mary supremely. Because of the love you felt, yes? Yes. You didn't happen to feel any of that love when you were outside of your body? No. When I was outside of my body, there, is no, there are no emotions, no feelings, nothing like that. Uh, part of the consciousness still wanted to 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 return to to life uh, because I basically and I, I believe that is the reason why people uh, don't die when they think of others. I didn't want to my parents, my husband, and my parents-in-law uh, to be sad. Be sad if we died. And I think for that reason, I was, uh, it wasn't a selfish reason. You know, I don't want to die because of myself. I want to live longer. No, it was a pure compassionate reason. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an understanding, you know, uh, in those splits of minutes or seconds, <clears throat> but no other experience. In a first uh, experience when I was a young girl, uh, I had a fear knowing 
somehow knowing that if that chewing gum, which is a silver thread, mm -hmm. if that you know breaks up, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. You know, and didn't know anything. You know, where would I go? Where would I end up? <clears throat> experience with Mother Mary is the most profound experience uh, in my life. Um, look, if it's possible to measure the in any measuring terms that love, uh, I would say all universes together. I would compare that love to the love that vibrates throughout the universes and parallel worlds. Has the memory of your near-death experience in the hospital faded over time? Never. It's still as fresh as it happened, as if it had happened yesterday. What about the memory of the encounter with Mother Mary? It's still here. It's present. It's ever present. Did you just have a knowingness that that was Mother Mary, or did she say or telepathically tell you, I'm Mother Mary? She didn't say anything telepathically. I just, when I turned my head and saw her, and I said, my mother. And I knew later on that, that it must be Mother Mary. Hmm. And, uh, you know, just to finish that up, once uh, and my heart was fully, fully, full of love, um, the the orb or the golden oriole around her mm -hmm. started reducing, and she started reducing as well to a very, very small, uh, small light, small orb, orb sphere kind of a light, and it just flew, you know, flew away, went away to the night, far, 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 far away. It's not just that it disintegrated, it just really reduced itself and went out. Do you fear death at all? No. No, because that is transition. As I said, that is, and I hope that uh, other people that are listening to this uh, will remove the fear of death from them, from, from, from the uh, mind. Um, it is not necessary. Really, it's not necessary. People who experience near-death experiences um, I, I believe are much more in tune with reality of, uh, I don't call it death, I call it transition. We will transit either vertically, stride away to the source, um, or some people might end up in bardo, which is death itself. Uh, it is the space between the life and uh, transition. It is a small kind of a space where people's soul, souls could be trapped for uh, for very long time unless somebody does the healing uh, on ancestors healing. And uh, usually it happened to people what I perceive, you know, living this life. Um, people remain in Bardo when they die suddenly. It's sudden, sudden death without illness, without this, without that, uh, because they are unprepared, haven't had a, a time to prepare themselves from in, inside uh, for possibility of dying. As I said, it usually, what I've seen, uh, it usually happens to people who are in a rush, sudden death, and uh, they soul tends to remain there around the family, around the house, or around the place of the accident. So it's very important to, um, to help those souls. Uh, but having this near-death experiences have, has helped me to understand that this is just a transition, what we perceive as a death. We are going back home, and the home is a sheer, pure consciousness, which is made of soft, soft light, antimatter. Uh, so 
it's a beautiful place to be. Everybody, what we consider in, in this world, everybody is a humans, but there, every consciousness understands the other consciousness, like, like all living in a commune of uh, consciousness, your consciousness, my consciousness, my cat's consciousness. Uh, we are all there. We all understand each other uh, without need to speak. Everything is just understanding. After your near-death experience, did you get any new abilities that you didn't have prior? Yes, I did. Um, I did. I became known as a teenager, someone who could predict the future. I mean, I had dreams, the dreams that came true. And I dreamt of many world events, earthquake in Turkey, 60,000 people would die. Uh, that was the first uh, earthquake in Turkey. Um, war in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, I actually made a painting, a paint about, you know, all six republics being separated in the blood. Um, that was two years before it started happening. Um, family situations, yes. As I said, I perceived death of my grandpa when I was only four and a half. Uh, uh, but I perceived it. I did not dream, dream of it. So I had uh, visionary dreams that came true. And those visionary dreams included tsunamis. I actually felt that I was in a wave of water. And the wave was so huge that I couldn't breathe. That I knew that I would die. But I wasn't there. I, as I said, it is a parallel world, parallel time. Yes, only parallel world and parallel times exist. So... Um, knowing from the dreams that Versace would be killed, and it was revealed who is behind that. Uh, no, uh, two weeks after that, I uh, basically knew that uh, I dreamt of Princess Diana would be killed, and I desperately tried to find some way in form of contact to warn her out. Uh, I wasn't able uh, to, uh, knowing at that time, and that she when she died, uh, that uh, the, the, her role in this lifetime, it was processed to me, was um, to bring a very young noble king in a William, but Harry will be the one to bring down the, uh, bring them down. And uh, that was during her funeral service, I perceived that. But in a dream, I was warned that she would die. Uh, and after that, many other things, you know, quite a number of things that I dreamt become true um, about my father, you know, and the gifts to a, uh, basically psychic abilities, either through doing the, I was reading in the cup, which is Turkish cup, cup uh, the Turkish, Turkish coffee cup reading. And uh, predictions were quite all right, with exception, and with a, such a big emphasis to it, never ever have I said to someone, uh, your husband is cheating, or your, this one is cheating, or this or that. Whatever came through, I was always, I just knew it, that I had to be careful not to influence a person or to do something bad. Always to encourage a person to look within itself, you know, whatever situation was. So, and uh, this did work. This did work for people quite good, and I'm happy about it. So near that experience has triggered in me psychic abilities. I could see my, one of my best friends passed away eight years ago. She was walking to my office that morning, and uh, I'm just saying it is quite difficult to, it was quite difficult to live this life doing academic work and uh, being this spiritual. So when Lei Tzu was walking down to my office, uh, she felt dizzy and I looked at her and I said, Sue, when I look at her head, I perceive dark energy here, you know, but behind her left ear, um, and I said, Sue, are you okay? She said, oh, you know, the doctor gave me antibiotics, but 
No, the doctor didn't want to give me antibiotics, and I've been feeling dizzy and funny. And I said, Sue, please go and check your brain. She had a brain, uh, uh, actually, she had a liver cancer, which uh, emerged to brain. So these are kind of things, even now, you know, if I see someone on the street, I don't tell them, you know, watch out. I can see it. So that was the last time I spoke about illness to somebody. Uh, because once we say cancer, you know, when, when Sue was diagnosed with the cancer, I said to her later on, Sue, you have to start loving that cancer. And she said, how? It's eating me alive. And I said, give it love because cancer is there out of some kind of a bitterness you are holding on. But she didn't. She couldn't simply turn herself and physical pain into loving something that she perceived was killing her. What other experiences have you had? I, well, this is the one that I was in search for answers for many years. After Mother Mary appeared to me, um, it would be about four or five nights down the truck. I was still in Belgrade and it was June. I would say it was 22nd June, 2006. Uh, my niece, uh, a first cousin niece, uh, invited me to their place for crepes. So I was trying not to go to avoid because I was tired from doing the business conferences and whatever. And uh, she said, but please auntie, your time is coming soon. You'll be going back to Sydney. So I said, okay, I'll come. Uh, her husband came to pick me up and we went there and we start, she started talking about the God and religion and this and that. And she said, Auntie, do you believe in God? I said, absolutely. Uh, but I didn't know about God, you know, when I was uh, your age. <laughs> so she said, uh, Vladan has got started growing a cross on his chest, which is a hair, you know, men's hair. And she said, can I just, can I show you? And I looked at her and I said, if he feels comfortable. So she unbuttoned his shirt and I was on the this side, on the right hand side of the coffee table, both of them on the left hand side. And as she was unbuttoning, I just, you know, kind of moved my body forward uh, to see the cross. And um, he, I remember him saying, I don't believe in priests, you know, and religions. I believe that there is some uh, superpower creator of everything. And at that moment, my body, I just perceived my body was no more body. My body became light. And it's not like a light, light that the whole body is in one big circle of light. Every single cell, Jeff, of my body became antimatter. And it was made, every single cell was made of three, three, three internal, I would now I can use the term orbs. So if the, one orb, second orb, third orb. So there were billions of orbs in my body and around my body. And my body was slightly lifted up. I perceived that, and uh, the light was going from up down, you know, from up like a like a chimney. I would say, you know, to to explain that. <coughs> At that moment, what I experienced during that that was a shock for me, and for the kids. But what I experienced was, uh, I am infinity. I am joy, I am love, time, time doesn't exist, only parallel worlds exist. And that stayed with me, that information or whatever came to me from, from that light, uh, it stayed for, with me forever, forever. So that's why I, I said, due to that particular experience, in particular, due to that experience, I fear no death. Because we will all go back to the creation. And that, to me, was, I was at that moment, a part of creation. 
I was in the heart of creator at that time. That's my uh, understanding. I share this uh, with some of my Buddhist friends and um, I actually saw the explanation from a high rank Rinpoche uh, who was um, serving as a manager to, manager to His Holiness Dalai Lama. Uh, and he told me that he has heard of something like that happening centuries ago, thousands of years ago, but there is nothing recorded in a Buddhist uh, scripts. So after that experience with the light, with Mother Mary and with the light, when I go back to Sydney, I basically got, not that I was promoting it, but I got some kind of a healing energies coming from my hands to the fact that one paraplegic boy who had a car accident where his mom and brother and dad died, um, his care was pushing him on the street where I had office. I was walking to post office to post something and uh, he, I said, hi, hi. And he said, hi. And the boy stopped me, his care stopped. And boy said, please take me to your place. You're gonna heal me. I mean, he was 19 at that time. So I said, okay, just let me drop in my letters. And then we walk back to my office and we, uh, we prayed. The boy and me prayed in the front because I always have, since that time, I can know Mother Mary. Uh, we prayed in front of her and believe it or not, the boy himself unstrapped the straps from his wheelchair and from his legs and he held himself on a desk, my work desk, and stood up and walked to um, to reception, to the waiting area. And his um, care, Peter, was crying. He says, what happened here could, hasn't happened in nine months in Liverpool Hospital. The boy asked me to go and live with him. And I said, well, I can't. You know, there are so many people in this world. You know, it would be a bit selfish just to serve one person. So that was a, one off example. Do you feel that Mother Mary was working through you as a conduit and she healed him? Uh, she healed him. No, uh, she has healed him because he had a fate in her. I don't think that I healed him. Yes, I healed him by, I was just a small instrument in a small bridge for him to be healed. I don't claim to heal him because uh, I did not put my hands on him. We just prayed together. And uh, he's, he was crying. The boy, boy was crying and said that uh, uh, she has healed him. And I said, yes, she has healed you. And uh, he said that um, uh, he's so grateful, full of joy, of course. Uh, but I said to him, what has healed you? is your fate. His fate that Mother Mary praying in front of the picture of Mother, uh, paint, not the painting of the icon of Mother Mary would heal him. So he, he was healed. Was he aware of your encounter with Mother Mary? Well, he was only aware that he would get a healing through me, not through me directly, because he insisted following me, coming to my office, and his uh, care was pushing his wheelchair. Um, you know, I didn't expect anything to happen. You know, I didn't expect miracle, big as it is, but I don't claim it, as I said, my miracle. It is Mother's Mary work. She's the greatest healer, and Jesus, and uh, she, and his faith. Jeff, in my lifetime, and is, you know, 43 years or let's say 50 years of um, uh, different, different kind of experiences, uh, I basically perceive information and knowledge that fate can heal us all. Our own fate. 
whether we believe in one saint, whether we believe Mother Mary, um, whether we believe whatever, even if we believe in a, in a pen, that is that faith that heals us, gives us the courage, and the body basically does heal. We all heal, can heal. What inspires you about your experiences? Love. Love for humans, love for everything, love for being being alive in this lifetime. Um, you know, as a mother, I must say that before these experiences happened, I was obsessively, possessively in love with my daughter, you know, or in love with my nephew. But this has become, you know, just the love for everybody. Even my next door neighbor, he might be junkie, but he'll, we have a mutual understanding and, you know, uh, love for each other. And when, when, when this is my experience, and I'm not pretending to be in love with everybody, but I, you know, I smile when I am out, and I just am in that state of love. And people, people feel it. They have, they all have senses. They feel that, you know, and they smile back. People who are not in tune with the antenna, uh, they don't feel it. And, you know, and I don't bother about that. You know, I'm not going uh, or shouting or, 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 or stopping people and telling this or that. No, when I walk out, I am in love with life. I am in love with all humans. Do you feel like you're the type of person that you could be in the grocery store and you're just loving and happy to be around humans and you'll even just talk to strangers? I always do. Strangers always approach me. I am like a radio uh, aerial for, for all the strangers, you know, to approach me on the streets and... Uh, I'd ask for help or for direction or for this or that, or just come across, you know, and, and start chatting. People trust me in general. That, that is, I think, the that state of love and uh, peace that I have. Uh, basically, people sense it and they trust that because that is what we all have. And, and most of the people search for it entire lifetime. Do you feel that it's not possible to generally experience that kind of love while being in this realm? Uh, well, it is. I mean, to me, it is. But when you turn down to uh, Tibetan Buddhists, uh, they are in love with everyone. They have that consciousness. They are, you know, from early childhood, their monks are taught about all aspects of compassion and, and for uh, ways in life, um, so they love everybody. They have that consciousness of love in their hearts and in their minds. So why it's not possible for the rest of the humans is just because um, from my own personal experience, when you are young, you want to achieve this, you have you know, work, go for work, go to the work, do the household and everything and everything. And the life just flies. And we don't have that uh, uh, knowledge or wisdom how to turn back to ourselves, to have times only exclusively for ourselves, to have a relationship with myself. That's the best part of it. I'm happy. You know, I live with my cat uh, on our own, and uh, we are happy. We love each other tremendously. If you had a friend that had recently lost somebody that had died, basically, and they were suffering and grieving, what kind of advice would you give them? Okay, the advice I would give to a suffering and grieving person who lost a dear one would be, you know, we have a, such a lovely expression in English, which is, 
uh, I am so sorry for your loss. It is the surviving member of family or whoever is alive. It is our loss, you know, when, when our ones die, it is our loss. And uh, the pain is our pain forever. For the person who passed away, um, it is extremely important. And this is something that I am teaching my daughter when I pass away, when I pass away, don't you dare cry because I will be in that space abode of consciousness. And most likely I will not come back again, but I will stay there because there you can, like a sister Francis, you can help someone from that space or realm. Uh, it's a, such a beautiful place to be in consciousness, in abode. Remember, it is a joy, it is a light, it is uh, communication with everyone. There are no fears, there are no illnesses, there is no death. That is permanency, all the nothing is permanent. So that's why it is infinitive. So I would tell that person, please do not cry. Take this as advice for someone who has had near death experiences, who has had, uh, so regression uh, uh, treatments three times, perceived how the soul went uh, and left the body. Body is just uh, body is just uh, an outfit. The tissues, it's all material, and that was given to us to be able to survive on planet Earth. So the person who died has returned to its natural natural state of being. I think, you know, if I didn't have these experiences, I would have been in a different, I would be having different opinion about how to tell someone not to feel bad, not to feel sad and um, devastated when somebody dies. What happens is basically, usually it happens in a split of a second, as I said, and uh, because we are humans and our biggest problem is attachment. When we attach ourselves, as, as I said, our love to my, my daughter, my nephew, um, to, to family, cousins, friends, you will see a pattern that these people, friends, for example, who is my friend now at the age of 62, you know, only two or three people, and I feel fortunate enough because I can talk with them about anything. But the life has removed attachments to other people by removing themselves from my life. So, so that is a pattern that we all should see that we are doing and detaching ourselves from. Um, Loving too much, well, there is a difference between love and love and possession and obsession. But loving too much is basically being too much attached to uh, our loved ones. Not only people are too attached to people, but they're also too attached to things. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I I tend to say I am. I am not wealthy, however, I am exceptionally rich with all my experiences and my life is so, so rich. So I feel confident who I am, what I am, what I do. Although maybe 20 years ago, I wasn't feeling like that. I was chasing money. I was chasing career. And while we are chasing that, we are chasing materialistic attachments to materialistic world and we become detached, detached from our own selves. That's where we make mistakes. My belief is we should be thinking about ourselves. And I believe basically that if we have relationships within ourselves, 
there will not be so many broken marriages in the world. Do you feel that we come here as a place to learn, as a place to play a game, or something else? This is a part of, uh, of, of Supreme Consciousness, of Supreme Creator, and it is a male energy. Um, it is basically his plan, but from his plan, we have different realms where everything is set out. In Christianity, it is um, uh, we, named, we named these realms archangels, but in the Buddhism, it's different. So my experience is there are different. There are 13 levels, levels of consciousness, uh, you know, where the top one is, and there is just eternity, creator. So uh, I would say that we are here to learn. We chose to come back uh, into this lifetime or any lifetime to learn and repair where we miss something. And if, whether we are, we are good or bad in parallel lives, uh, it doesn't matter. We took our lessons with us. And that's why we have certain deja vus. I mean, as a young girl, I always say deja vus. Always, you know. Uh, seeing a face, seeing a person, hearing some words, you know, or some things uh, being spoken that I already knew, you know. And that was a big question mark and puzzle for me. So we are here to learn and to make a complete circle, I would say, of uh, of that eternal part of the consciousness that is seated within us or uh, uh, seeded in us. Liliana, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Uh, yes, I am quite open. Otherwise, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing this this morning today. Uh, I am available on Facebook, but there are two profiles on Facebook. Uh, one is where I was much younger with the short hair and sunglasses. That one is not on the other one where I am as I am, you know, at this age. Um, they can reach me through there or through Messenger or my email address. And my email address is um, my academic business uh, email address, which is Liliana, L-I-L-I-A-N-A -A at goldbergconsulting.com.au uh, Note, Goldberg Consulting is one word. So Liliana at goldbergconsulting.com.au would be my email, and that would be the most preferred way of communication with me. Would you like me to put a link to your Facebook profile and your email in the video description? Yes. Okay. Thank you for doing that. Sure. Well, Liliana, before we finish up, can you give us one last positive message? One last positive message would be a message of uh, permanency, and that is trust yourself, as my countrywoman said. Um, no matter how many mistakes we have in life, they are all learning tools for all of us. Don't suffer and don't cry for your deceased family members, their loved ones, they are in a safe place. They are, they completed their they own mission in, in a lifetime, what they were predestined or assigned by them so, their souls to do. And uh, you are only, basically we are all only crying for our own loss. And isn't that a selfish thing to do? It should be pure love. You know, just love those souls and, and send them love from heart uh, so that they can ascend to the light. Uh, light a candle for them, whatever your practice is or your belief is. Uh, but light, candle, always works. Always works. I just want to say that recently in February, I lost my auntie, 
maternal half sister. She didn't want to have to do anything with this part of family because we are from the second uh, mother, different mothers. And uh, when she was diagnosed with cancer in February this year, she wanted to get in touch with us. And my daughter and me, we flew to, from Sydney to Brisbane to see her in the hospital. She was so, so happy. She died with a smile on her face. Two days after that, she passed away. She was very helpful, and, uh, very grateful. And uh, she said that she feels so bad for missing so many years of love that she could have, you know, and missing on seeing her niece or grandniece uh, growing up. However, I told her, you have given us in such a short period of time, before the end of your time, you have given us all the love. And we will carry on that love. So we did not cry. She cried a bit because that was her uh, said uh, her sadness for missing this, uh, missing being involved in our lives. Uh, but that night uh, when she passed away, I lit a candle and left it in a small, uh, you know, to burn in a small uh, 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 glass for alcohol for shot for snaps. Snaps, and when it burned down, it burned down in a shape of heart. Mm. It melted in a shape of heart. So that is another message for me uh, <clears throat> that I would like to share. Don't ever, ever cry for losing someone. You are actually blocking the energies and their souls from evolving, moving up. Liliana. Thank you for that message, and thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Um, thank you so much. This is my first public opening, and I thought uh, I I just do it because uh, Nevena has done it, and one of my cousin brothers told me once, sister, you have so many experiences, and he is in a um, martial arts back in Serbia and he said sister it's selfish not to share your knowledge and wisdom you must do that so thanks everyone and thank you for having me today and opening up to the people well it was a pleasure having you and hopefully more Yugoslavians will now come and want to share I hope so I hope so and I'm sure they will. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.